Hey everybody, in this video we have a big topic. Here's what we're doing. We're talking about socially efficient and inefficient market outcomes. Now, to understand this, guys, we need to understand about our economic system. See, economic systems answer really important questions. What do economic systems answer? They answer what we're going to produce, how we're going to produce it, who's going to produce it, and who's going to get it, okay? Some really important questions. Now, what is at the base of our economic system, and pretty much every economic system in the world, besides a few countries out there, are markets. That's right. We have market-based economies. Really important. I am not saying free market economies. I'm saying market-based economies, which means at the base, we have decentralized suppliers acting in their private interest and decentralized demanders acting at their private interests. That's what that's at the base of our economy, okay? Now, certainly what we often say is we have a mixed economy where we have markets, but we also have government intervention. But here's the big thing. Besides a few goods out there, say national defense or public safety or K through 12 education in a lot of places, besides a few goods out there, we have basically markets doing a lot of the heavy lifting with some government intervention in those markets, okay? And just to say something really quickly about macro and micro, when we talk about government intervention, there's kind of macro interventions, which is called monetary policy and fiscal policy, where we're really trying to affect the economy as a whole with those policies. And then there's micro interventions, where we're intervening in individual markets based on different characteristics of those markets and different economic and political desires related to those markets, okay? So here's the big thing I want you to understand. When it comes to being socially efficient, most of the time, this thing left completely alone is not going to give us what we call a socially efficient outcome, okay? The only way that this thing, suppliers and demanders left completely alone, are going to give us this socially efficient outcome is if a whole set of uh, criteria are met. The biggest one meaning no market failures. And guys, there's a lot of market failures out there. The two biggest that you're going to encounter in a microeconomics class are externalities. Externalities are situations where third parties, somebody outside of the market participants, the market participants or market actors are the supplier and demanders, third parties are somebody other than the supplier and demanders being impacted by either the production or the consumption of a good, okay? We call these externalities, and in those situations we say the market actors are not internalizing these external cost or external benefits that might be hurt, uh, hitting third parties, okay, that third parties are incurring, all right? That's one of the biggest market failures we have. But there's other market failures. There's things like asymmetric information, where one side of the market knows more about the good than the other one. We also kind of assume perfect knowledge about prices, okay, which is oftentimes quite rare, though the, you know, era of the internet is helping that one out a little bit. Um, there's also situations known as market power, and we all know this, right? Monopoly power, market power, where we don't have what's called perfect competition, okay? We don't have just a uh, almost unlimited number of suppliers of a good, and all of them are making pretty much the same type of good. In fact, we have what's really called a monopolistically competitive environment, okay? Where we have a bunch of firms that have some market power, okay? So, again... For the most part, there are oftentimes market failures that are out there, and if that is the case, they are not going to achieve what we call max societal surplus, okay? A socially efficient outcome, okay? So here's the thing. Let me just give you that definition of a market failure. A market failure is a situation where if we leave our market actors completely alone, they fail to, they fail to achieve allocated efficiency and therefore max social surplus, okay? So that's the deal. Now, if we did have a situation there was no market failures or some industry out there that has no market failures, um, I think of maybe babysitting getting close to that, but as soon as I say that, I know some people out there will probably poke holes in that, but maybe babysitting being pretty close to that one, we might actually have a, a situation where these two actors give us that socially efficient outcome, all right? Now, Here's the deal. Before I go any further, I want to back up a little bit about what we even mean by efficiency, okay? Economists are obsessed with efficiencies, and we even have three major types that we kind of look at when we're evaluating different industries or different markets out there. Number one, are we productively efficient, okay? Productive efficient means we're producing at the lowest possible cost. 
Generally, we think that markets help us achieve that, okay? Because private actors are subject to profit and loss statements, okay? Revenue minus cost equals profit. And so, hey, they want to increase the revenues, decrease the cost. They're very incentive to decrease those, uh, those costs. So market actors do a pretty good job of this. The next one is distributively efficient, okay? To being distributively efficient means the goods are going to those who value them the, the, the most. Now, right off the bat, we need to understand that demand is not just based on willingness to buy a good, but willingness and ability, okay? And in market-based economies, generally we have some income inequality, and if that income inequality is for things that are not equitable reasons, which most of us would say, yep, there's some you know, situations in society that are not fair, not equitable, okay? If that's what the result of it is, then we're gonna have situations where perhaps people's demand curve don't really represent the true value they put on the good. So this one's really kind of interesting when you think of markets. It's really hard, especially for needs, to get distributively efficient, meaning getting the goods to those who value them the most, because again, demand's based on willingness and ability, and not everybody has that ability to buy the products, okay? One other thing about distributive efficiency. It's not as easy to help out on that as you might think. You know, coming in with, say, a price ceiling, okay, actually affects distributive efficiency in a very negative way oftentimes because yes it makes it more affordable but it makes the rationing of the good no longer on, on price and therefore something else steps in like networks or wait times or things like that which also lead to distributive inefficiency okay so this is a really kind of hard one whether or not we intervene or don't intervene in the marketplace we really have to kind of focus on income inequality to help out on that one then there's allocative efficiency. Oftentimes, we say this one um, along with max social surplus. If we're allocatively efficient, we're achieving maximum societal surplus. Well, allocative efficiency means we've allocated the right amount of resources to the production of the good. We're producing at what we are going to call Q-opt, which I'm going to show you on this graph, Q-opt, okay? Q-opt means we're making the right amount. We're not overproducing the good or underproducing the good. We're producing just the right amount of the good. Now, truly, truly, you need to be allocatively efficient. You've got to produce the right amount. And productively efficient, you have to do it in the lowest possible way. The producers who are the least costly in their production process should be the ones producing it. And you've got to be distributively efficient. It's got to go to those who value it the most to truly achieve maximum societal surplus. That's right. You've got to make the right amount of the good. Allocate the right amount of resources to the good. Those who value it the most have to get the good. And the firms that are the... Um, lowest cost producers need to make it. Again, all of this is quite difficult, but yes, government can help out on a lot of this stuff. The markets, there's a reason why they're at the base. They're not bad sometimes at doing this stuff. Maybe they have the, you know, some, they definitely have issues there because of income inequality that's out there. It's really not the market itself, it's the income inequality that's the issue. And yeah, they've got some issues here, especially when it comes to externalities, but, and we'll talk about that. So here's the deal. But markets still kind of get as close a lot of times to these efficiencies. Maybe not as close as we want to be, but then we can intervene with the government to also help push the market in the direction that we want the market to go. All right, before I go any further, let's just put some other really kind of foundational stuff out there. Socially efficient. Socially efficient. Da, 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 right? Those three efficiencies. Oftentimes, graphically, when we're going to talk about maximum social surplus, we're going to be talking about producing where the marginal societal cost and marginal societal benefit curves intersect. This marginal societal cost has all the private costs the supplier would incur, plus any external cost or external benefits have been taken into account for the marginal societal cost curve, okay? Now, when I say benefits, I mean, if there were some benefits from production, okay? There's not a lot of things that have positive externalities for production where production actually produces spillover benefits to other people, but there are a few places that that is the case. So, marginal social cost, it's got all of the private cost in it and any additional cost from production, or if there was additional benefits from uh, consumption, we've netted those out and we put that there. I like to say this is the ultimate thing we care about, societal cost. It's got everything in there from that cost standpoint, at least from, produ from producing. Societal benefit, right? Marginal societal benefit. 
On the consumption side, this curve's got everything in it. It's got the private benefit plus any spillover or negative externalities that are hurting third, party, third parties, or if there's a situation where third parties are gaining from the consumption of the good, that's also in there. We've got everything that we need in there, okay? If there's additional benefits, we've added those in. If we're hurting third parties from the consumption, we've netted those out to get that line. Where these two curves intersect, okay, right there, and I don't even like to call that an equilibrium because we're not drawn to this dot. That's really important kids understand, okay? So I don't ever put an E where those two red curves are intersecting. That gives us Q opt, right? That Q opt, we're generally going to associate with maximum social surplus. Now, again, it actually is allocatively efficient. It means we're producing the right amount of the good, but... We still need to be distributively and productively efficient, but we're gonna generally say the market's kind of handling that by determining who gets the good based on price, even though there's that issue of income inequality, and hey, you've gotta have costs below the price to even produce it. Anybody else, you're not gonna produce it. That's gonna make us, only the firms that are productively efficient produce the good, okay? So there's our QOP. Again, as we've already said, supply and demand, they're gonna give us our market outcome, but it might not be socially efficient. Imagine both of these are good A and good A, okay? And I'm just separating out what I like to call the P curves from the S curves, okay? Private cost, private benefit from the societal cost, societal benefit. You can see the market left alone is giving us a socially inefficient outcome. We're over allocating resources to the production of the good. So what can we do with our market in this situation? Most economists would say, let's go with a market-based intervention known as a per-unit tax. Let's go ahead and put a tax on per-unit produced slash consumed of the good on those market participants. So what we could do is we could come in and bring in a, let's get that Q opt kind of right there. So we can get a tax. We could just get it just to be perfect. That tax wedge could come in here just like this. This is our per unit tax. That top dot's gonna give me my PC. That bottom dot's gonna give me my PP. This was the price market before the intervention. This intervention is pushing up the price for the consumer to get them to buy less, okay? You can think of this as a more optimum price, okay? A price that reduces the quantity demanded right there. So go ahead and do that. So there's my reduction quantity demanded because that PC went up. And then that PP going down reduces the benefit to the producer, gets a movement along the supply curve like this, reducing quantity supply. Excellent. This intervention is reducing QD and QS so that our output is now Q tax, which is also Q opt, and we are socially efficient. Now, I have to say, in this video, I kind of went really broad and then I came back really narrow. What do I mean by that? I was trying to talk about a lot of market failures that could be out there, right? Market power, asymmetric information. I even talked about how inequality can affect things. And then by the end of the video, I really focused in on externalities as being a market failure and just trying to correct the externalities. A situation where we must have had for the production of this good, a negative externality. And if you actually look at the graph closely, you'll see I was associating with the supply of the good, that there was external cost, okay? And what we did with that tax, we pushed that tax in, we made our market participants internalize the full cost of their actions. And when they internalized the full cost of their actions, they did less of this thing, okay? They produced and consumed less, pushing us to QOP. But again, it's not just about correcting for externalities, even though oftentimes I'm saying an IB or an AP test it is. It's also about the market power, the asymmetric information, and all of those other market failures that exist out there. And again, income inequality. You gotta look at that too, because remember, demand, not just willingness, but also ability to buy the good. So is our income distribution equitable? Is it fair? And if it's not, well, we're always gonna have some problems with those market-based economies when it comes to the needs of society. Anyhow, hope that helped you out. We'll see you in the next video.